Well, in our summer series that we've been going through, uh, Dwayne has been presenting, mostly Dwayne has been presenting, a message along the lines of the mission that matters and living as a church, living as people that are on mission, mission for the glory of God, to bring about his plan, to bring about his will, to live, to honor him. And within that main category, we've talked about several different smaller categories, and right now we're talking about the empowered life. And there's been four components for the empowered life. We've looked at uh, pay, or persistence, we've looked at passion, persistence, and last week Dwayne talked about defiance, defying the opposition. That we live with power, we live with boldness, we live with a purpose. And that's to defy the opposition because we are powered by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're talking about today. We're summing up this four-part series on the empowered life, which really means the Spirit-filled life. So, as we are going to look at that, I think one of our main struggles is this, that we get overwhelmed, we get pressured, in producing results, don't we? We get caught up with the mentality of producing results. We, uh, this happens to us a lot, especially in our jobs, in our families, at school, all over. We go to work, and if we don't produ produce the right results, man, we're punished, right? Or we, we, get, we get in trouble some sort or in some way. If we go to school and we don't produce the right results on the tests or on homework, it catches up with us because we're not doing a very good job. In our family lives, man, if we're not producing the right results as husbands, as wives, as fathers, as sons, as daughters and mothers, then it begins to catch up with us. And we get trapped into that mentality that really our life is about producing results. And it catches up, catches up with us in the spiritual life, doesn't it? Because we begin to think that spiritually, that's what it's about, is us producing the results. The last time I talked to you, uh, I talked about, uh, I used the illustration of, of a tomato plant and the fruit that, that a tomato plant produces and how I love tomato sandwiches in the summertime. It's, it's the same way in our spiritual lives. If we don't produce the fruit or the results that we think we should be producing, man, we get discouraged, don't we? And this happens over the course of our spiritual lives because every corner that we turn there's failure we realize oh, I, I just I didn't do good I messed up again I've dropped the ball again and we begin to realize that it's almost impossible for us to produce the results that God requires don't we Has this ever happened to you I can think of several instances in my life, and I think I've shared this one with you before, but when I was in seminary, man, I thought that it was going to be easy to be spiritual because I'm in seminary. I'm paying a ton of money. I went to the same seminary, Dallas, that, uh, that Dwayne went to, and man, it was awesome. It was a great time, but I can tell you that I started out there on a spiritual high, and by two semesters in, the end of my first year, I was not on a spiritual high. I was on an academic high, but I wasn't on a spiritual high. I was studying God's Word. I was learning to read the text of Scripture in the original languages. I was reading all kinds of theology. I was learning all kinds of stuff. I was memorizing Scripture. I was learning how to think. But there was a major disconnect in my thinking and in my heart. I wasn't producing spiritual fruit. I could recall texts like that. I could look up all kinds of Greek words, do word studies, look through the most scholarly articles and read them and understand it. And it was awesome. Don't get me wrong. And it, I mean, it still is. It's good. It's beneficial. But the problem is that I focused on the academic. I focused on what really wasn't that important to God. And my spiritual life suffered. So, I was trapped into thinking that the results of going to seminary was making good grades. And I make good grades, that's good. But really, the result of going to seminary and getting that theological education, that foundation to build on, 
was really to grow closer to God. And that wasn't happening until it was brought to my attention by my loving wife and several others. And I realized, hey, I, I've gotten off track here. And I began to realize that it is possible to be a Christian, to be called a Christian, to say that Christ is my God, but to not be spiritual. It is easy to do that. It's easy to fall in that track, to claim to be a Christian. Man, I, yes, I believe I walked the aisle in, or at this time, I, I was baptized at this point, and yes, I've gone to church for a long time. But are you spiritual? Are you spiritually alive? Are you spiritually growing? Are you spiritually producing? That's the question we're going to look at today. And the founder of Dallas Seminary in his book, He That Is Spiritual, uh, has a statement in here that I thought would be interesting to get us started. He says on page 23, A Christian is a Christian because he is rightly related to Christ. But he that is spiritual is spiritual because he is rightly related to the Spirit in addition to his relation to Christ in salvation. Now, I thought that was really good because it, it kind of embodies what I was just talking about, that we can be called Christians. We can, we can call ourselves Christians and say that we are devoted to Christ, but still be spiritually lacking. We can still be on a spiritual low, even though we're called Christians. So today, I want to look at what, what does it look like to live a life that is truly powered by the Spirit, where we are empowered to accomplish the mission of God? What does it look like to be powered by the Spirit? Well, today, I want, to, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 25 today. And if you have a Bible, I would love for you to turn there because we, there's, we're going to see a lot of good stuff in here. And the first thing that we're, or the, the main thing that we're going to see is that God's word shows us that the empowered life is supernatural. The empowered life is spiritual. Now, I know whenever I say that, some of you are thinking, well, yeah, of course it is. But the easy thing is that I've said that to myself a thousand times, it feels like. And I still don't get it. I still forget it all the time. I still get caught up in measuring spiritual results. I try to find a way to measure the spiritual results. And if you don't struggle with that, let me tell you, I do, especially as one of the pastors here. Because if I can't find spiritual results, spiritual progress, I feel like I'm not doing a good job. And that's my temptation. And it's a wrong temptation because only God can bring about spiritual results. Only God is the one that's capable of bringing about spiritual fruit. I can do all the right things. I can say all the right things, just like you can do all the right things and say all the right things. But unless God is in it, it's just not going to go anywhere. So if we look in Acts 8, 4 through 25, we're going to see that God's word shows us that the empowered life is supernatural. It's a spiritual life. It is not natural. The empowered life is supernatural in its power and in its results. And we're going to see three parts to this. So let's start looking in, uh, well, first, the, the, the context of chapter 8 in the book of Acts is this. Stephen has just given an, an awesome sermon, the best sermon that you could ever give. And as a result of that, he was put to death. He was killed. He was stoned at the hands of Saul, who's later going to become Paul. Well, the, the introductory verses for chapter 8 says, And Saul approved of this execution, Stephen's execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lament lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So we see that the, the context of this whole, pair, or this whole chapter is Saul going about the villages, dragging out men and women, probably beating them and doing all kinds of things and putting them in prison. And if you claim to be a Christian, that was the result of your belief. Wow. 
So that's the setting in which we're going to look at. So verse 4 says this. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Isn't that an awesome verse? In the midst of persecution, in the midst of the terrible persecution, the punishing persecution that was going on, could you imagine being beaten and thrown in prison for your faith? I couldn't. But there's places in the world today that that, that would happen to you. And that's what was happening here. But that's not what Philip did. That's not what those who were scattered, that's not what they did. And they didn't just give up, fall back, and say, all right, it's not, it's not worth it. Okay, I get it. No. They said, all right, we're pushed out. Here we go. And as we're going, we're going to preach the word. So the first thing that I want you to see about living the empowered life is this. The Spirit enables you to confidently proclaim Christ. The Spirit enables you. It gives you the ability to do something that on your own accord you would not be able to do. It enables you to talk in a way that normally you wouldn't be able to talk in. And I'm not talking about something crazy, but I'm talking about talking with confidence, talking with boldness, talking out of faith because you believe it. So it, the Spirit enables you to confidently proclaim Christ. So look back in verse 4, it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. In verse 5, Philip went down to a city of Samaria. This passage right here is going to give us the context for the rest of the, the sermon that we're, or the passage that we're going to look at. Verse 5 says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. And this is the reason for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had, who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. In verse 8, so there was much joy in that city. So we see Philip is dispersed from Jerusalem. He leaves, but he leaves with a mission. He leaves with the ability to do something that normally he wouldn't be able to do. He's enabled by the power of the Spirit to go on his way with confidence, with boldness, with wisdom, with guidance, and to preach God's word. He proclaims the truth. The important thing here is that Philip, in his obedience to the Spirit, he went obediently preaching God's word. He proclaimed the gospel message, and he crossed ethnic and cultural boundaries. See, Philip went to Samaria. Now, as a Jew, and as someone who's living in Jerusalem, that is one area that you just did not go to. You did not go to the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a half-breed. They were people that you just didn't associate with. You looked down on them. You didn't care about them. So Philip does the unthinkable. And he crosses ethnic and cultural boundaries to proclaim a message that was originally intended for the Jews, but then was opened up to a worldwide audience. So Philip goes to the most unlikely place that he should have gone and preaches the word. That's convicting for me because it pushes me out of my comfort zone. And it makes me ask this question, Will, are you going? Will, are you crossing ethnic and cultural boundaries with an openness, with a heart of love, with a care and concern for those people? tell them about Christ. And it makes me think as a church, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to go where we normally wouldn't go with the gospel message of Christ? Are we open to where God might have us go? Because we don't see it as, as our job. We don't see it as, as just something that we're supposed to do. And we don't see it as results based. We just see it as simply obedience to Christ because we love him. We care about him. We want his name to be known. Well, Philip, that was his mentality. Philip gives us a wonderful example to follow here. He gives us a wonderful example of what it looks like to be a Christian that is on mission. Well, as a result of Philip's obedience, 
in the spirit, he was able to do things that he normally wouldn't be able to do. I mean, you can look in, in uh, verse 7. The reason that people were completely and totally amazed, the reason that people were shocked and surprised was that Philip had a power and an ability to do something that, that he typically wouldn't be able to do. I mean, there, it says that there's unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice, and they came out of many different people. I mean, you've got crazy stuff happening here. You have people that were paralyzed being able to get up and walk. You have people that were lame or, or, or that were injured that were, that were being healed. Now, I don't know if we can do that today. I don't think that we can. I don't think that that's the way God is going to work, but he could. I don't know. He's able to. He's certainly able to. But what I want to, what I want to draw your attention to is not the result of what was happening, but the heart that Philip had and his, obedient to Christ, his obedience to Christ, his yielding to the Spirit of God. I remember Dwayne mentioning a couple weeks ago that, that we can, uh, he kind of said the same thing, that we can be Christians. We can claim to be, to be Christians. And the Spirit does live in us. He indwells us when we receive Christ. But that doesn't mean that we're filled by Him. We are able to grieve the Spirit. Look in Ephesians, I think chapter 4. We're able to grieve the Spirit when we deliberately disobey the Spirit of God. It hurts Him. It hurts Him. And we're not living filled by the Spirit. We're living filled by the self. We're not doing what God has called us to do. We're doing what we want to do. Philip gives us an example to follow. Philip is living in obedience, filled by the Spirit, preaching with power, with boldness, with wisdom, with confidence. And he goes and does amazing things, or God does amazing things through him for everyone's benefit. The second thing that I want you to notice here in verse 8 is that the Spirit inspires others through you to find joy in new life. When you live obediently to the Spirit, when you live a life that is powered by the Spirit of God and that is supernatural in and of its life and its ability, not only does it enable you to go to proclaim Christ, but it inspires others around you. See, we look to inspire others, right? I mean, no one wants to be the person that walks in the room and everybody goes, oh no, he's just going to drag it down. See, we want to walk in the room and everybody go, oh good, yeah, Will's here. Yeah, he, he's a pretty cool guy, I like him. We want to be inspiring, right? We want to have a positive effect on people. And if you don't, maybe, <laughs> maybe you should do some self-evaluation. But usually that's how it is. We want to walk in the room and bring it up a level. The only way to really do that, the only way to do that with eternal consequences is to preach the gospel. When we embody the gospel message, when we live based on the power of the Spirit, we inspire others around us. I can't tell you how many times there's been, there's been numerous times when, when Karen comes into the office and she'll, she'll make a comment like, you know what, Christ, I, th this, this is just for a short time. Christ is coming back. That's right. And that is the spirit of God talking because without him, there's no way in the world she would say that. It lifts everybody up. The message of the gospel, the truth of the gospel lifts everybody up. The only way to inspire our church, the only way to inspire this community, the only way to inspire your families, your friends, is to talk about Christ and what he's done for you and what he can do for us. See, we have eternal hope in Christ. We know that he's going to come back. We know that we're just waiting. We're waiting for the day. But in our waiting, we have an important mission to do. In our waiting, we have the chance to tell people, to inspire people with the gospel. I hope, I hope and pray that you would see it as your personal responsibility. It's not an option. It's your personal responsibility to share the gospel.
that's it. The only way we're going to grow our church is for you to embody that message and take it out and to tell the people that live around you, that you work with, about what Christ has done and what he can do for them. That's the only way it's going to happen. And it's going to happen because God chooses to do it, because he's the one that's going to bring it about. Well, that's exactly what Philip did. Look in verse 8. He says, or the, the text says this. As a result of Philip's preaching the gospel message, as a result of the works that he did for the people that were there, so there was much joy in that city. Wow. Could you walk? Have you ever been to a city where you just pulled into town and you got out of your car and you said, gosh, there's so much joy in this city. I don't know if I ever have, but apparently Luke, it was so magnificent. It was so changing. It was so compelling that Luke had to document it. Luke saw in a Samaritan village where the gospel had never been as a result of Philip's preaching that there was so much joy in this city. They had to write it down. They had to write it down on a page in black and white for us to read it 2,000 years later to realize that if we talk about the gospel, it'll make people happy, genuinely happy. It'll bring about real joy. Man, it should compel us to talk about the gospel. It should compel us to live it. There's a lot of hurt and pain in this town. It's depressing sometimes. Drug issues, family issues, family issues as a result of drug issues, alcohol problems, all kinds of different situations, cancer, people with genuine hurts, people with, with pain that, that you just can't fix easily. The only thing that will change that, the only thing that will inspire change is the gospel. Honestly, we could come up with the most crazy, thing here. We, I mean, I don't even know. We could have the, the most incredible, awesome program. We could have the most dynamic speaker in the world. And the apathy level of this community would say, eh, I don't think I need it. But the truth of the gospel changes people because God is the one doing the changing. We're not wowing anybody. It's God. God is the one that's bringing it about. Well, there's a third part of this, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 25. So what, what Luke has done in this passage, in verse 8, he gives the setting. There's persecution in Jerusalem. It sends everybody out. The positive example is Philip goes on preaching. He doesn't get discouraged. He doesn't go, man, I just want to go home. He goes, no, I'm going to go with a mission. And then he gives a summary passage for all of what's happening in Samaria. And Philip is the one that's doing the work. And Luke explains that, hey, God was changing people through Philip and through his obedience to him. And there's joy as a result of that. And then he gets specific with a personal example here. So in verse 9, he says this. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. I'm gonna do that? Man, I, I'd love to stand with people and say, hey, I'm somebody great. Watch me. Verse 10, they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. This dude is somebody special. We need to follow him. We need to listen to what he says, man. He knows what he's doing. Verse 11 says, and they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Verse 12, whenever you see a but in scripture, you need to circle it because it's contrasting what was happening. Verse 12 starts out, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. You have Simon, the magician. 
In the historic text, his name is Simon Magus, because Magus is the Latin form of magician. But really, he's labeled magician here, but really he's a sorcerer. I mean, this guy was practicing demonic stuff. He was able to do things that people genuinely were amazed at. I mean, they, they were, holy cow, this guy can do stuff. I mean, it wasn't shuffle the card deck, pull out the card, and I'll pick your card. Now, it wasn't that kind of magic. It was like, he was able to do some things like heal people and do different things that, that were amazing. If you read the ancient literature, jo uh, literature uh, Josephus and several people make mention of this guy and his, his ability and how he was well known. He's actually, uh, some think that he's the father of Gnosticism. So he has a legitimate claim here. People really were wowed. People really were just amazed. I mean, I, I guarantee, if this guy rolled into town, rolled into La Fala, and started doing his thing, I guarantee, I, I'd want to go check it out. I, I'm just curious. I'd want to see it. He was doing some crazy stuff. But not compared to what Philip was doing right? Because we see in verse 12, but when they believed Philip, see we have Simon coming in doing all this crazy stuff, and then Philip comes into town with the power of God. And the power of God supersedes anything that Simon is able to do. I mean to the point that people are completely shocked. Even Simon himself is saying, there ain't no way I can do that. I can't do it. I cannot compete with the power of God. Let me say this, the third thing that we need to notice, when we live the empowered life, the first was the Spirit enables us to proclaim Christ, right? The second one is that through the preaching of the gospel, the Spirit is the one that inspires change, inspires hope. The third thing is this, the Spirit testifies to the power of God through us. Through our obedience to the Spirit and living the spiritual life, the Spirit is the one that testifies to the power of God. We don't. We live in obedience, but we don't have to wow people. We're not like Simon, the magician, or the sorcerer. We don't have to come up with all kinds of fancy, crazy tricks. It's the Spirit. He's the one that empowers us. He's the one that brings about the supernatural. When I say supernatural, I mean this. I don't mean something crazy where I could make Dwayne levitate or something crazy. I mean this. When Jesus Christ entered your life and saved you from death, friend, that is supernatural. That is what I mean. Supernatural is God in his sovereign grace reached down and rescued you from death. There is no way you can bring that about. He did it. You didn't. You believe and walk, yes. You humbly obey, yes. But he's the one that brought the life that you couldn't get. Okay, so that's what I mean by supernatural. So the Spirit testifies to the power of God through you. So Philip's supernatural power was so intriguing, was so captivating, that look at this, Simon wanted to buy it. Okay, so, so in verse 13, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Verse 14 says this. So you had the apostles who were waiting in Jerusalem, right? We saw that at the beginning of chapter 8. Philip went, he's preaching, he's doing all these things, God is working. So Philip sends word to the apostles, says, hey, you guys, you guys got to get down here. I mean, uh, God is doing some crazy things. Okay, verse 14 says, now... When the, apostle, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I just want to make a note of this, that for, for us today, when we receive Christ, we receive the Spirit. He's in us. For some reason here, and I think it's because of the cultural boundaries, the Spirit came when they were in Jerusalem. And he's doing all these works in Jerusalem. Most commentators that I read said this. Probably the issue was Philip goes, proclaims Christ, and because of the cultural barrier and in it, 
in that it's the Samaritans, Peter and John have to go down and pray for the Spirit to come. So I think this is just a historical setting issue right here. So in verse 17 it says, Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now look at this in verse 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands can receive the Holy Spirit. He says, man, if, if that's all you do, hey, can I buy it from you? I'd like to buy that. I'd like to buy that. Because it's, you're doing some pretty crazy stuff. And if I had that power, do you know how I could wow people here? Do you know what kind of money I could make with that kind of power? So Philip, or so Peter and John rebuke him right here. Verse 18, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on hands, he wanted to offer them money. Verse 19, saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands can receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, but Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Do you see that phrase in there? The gift of God. The supernatural life. The spiritual life that we live in, it's a gift of God. You can't buy it. You can't do anything to achieve it. It's a gift. A gift is given and is to be received. Right? There's nothing you can do to get it. Nothing you can do to get it. It's a gift. So after Peter rebukes him, he says, You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord, that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven of you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Simon, I, I don't know here, there's much debate on whether Simon was actually a believer or not, legitimately. Because there's several, there's, there's valid arguments for both sides of it. Simon, I mean, it says he believed. Yes, it does says that, or say that. But at the end, in verse 24, when he says, pray for me to the Lord, Peter didn't tell him, just ask me and I'll pray to the Lord. He says, you pray to the Lord, you ask forgiveness, you repent. And it seems like Simon is kind of, you know, sarcastically saying, okay, well, you, you go and pray. You go pray for me, and, and hopefully God will have forgiveness on me. Well, there's an interesting thing that I want to point out here. It's an interesting contrast between Philip and Simon. I don't know if Simon fully was a believer. Uh, that's for heart, or that's for the for God to know, because he only knows the heart of people, right? But I can say this, that Simon was concerned with the sensational. Philip was concerned with the supernatural. Simon was concerned with wowing people. Simon was concerned with his ability to impress, his ability to coerce, his ability to manipulate, his ability to do things to people that normally they wouldn't buy into because of the devil and his power. Simon was interested in self, and that was it. He wanted to promote himself. Philip wanted to promote the gospel. Philip was concerned about God. Philip was concerned about bringing glory to God. He wasn't worried about coercing, manipulating, talking anybody into anything. The only thing he was concerned with was presenting the gospel message clear and confident so that people were presented with a choice. Either I choose to believe and accept it, or I choose to deny it and walk away. Philip's heart was concerned about the glory of God. That should tell us something. That should cause us to evaluate ourselves and our church. Are we concerned with wowing? Let me tell you, the devil loves to wow. Man, he loves to wow. He will wow you until you just can't take it anymore. You've got to buy into it. 
But the Spirit of God is concerned with your growth, with your maturity, and with your salvation. He doesn't care about wowing you. He cares about what's real, what's going to last. As a church, are we concerned with wowing? Or are we concerned with communicating the gospel message so that the Spirit does His work? Are we concerned about impressing people for our own benefit? Or are we concerned about presenting the clear option of spiritual life or spiritual death? I think Philip is teaching us here in this example that the only thing that we should be concerned with is what matters to God. And that's his own glory. That's his own proclamation. That's his own truth. Also, I want to offer a caution to you that not all spiritual things are good. Simon shows us this. See, there are demonic activities at work. And I'm not joking. I am being honest. The biggest mistake that we can make is to ignore that there's an opposition. The biggest mistake any team makes when they lose a game is to ignore the strengths of the opposition, right? There is demonic activity. There is a devil, and he is working, and there are demons that are working, trying to do everything in their power to prevent the proclamation of the gospel, to prevent the changed life from happening. And you better believe that, or you'll get caught up in it. Simon was caught up in that. Philip comes with the power of the gospel, with the truth of Scripture, with Jesus Christ. He comes under the Spirit's enabling. He comes with the inspiration that only the Spirit of God can bring. He comes with the testimony of the power of God through God's working. And changes people with the power of God. So I want to ask you, are you concerned with wowing? Are you concerned with bringing results on your own? On your own power? Under your own strength? Or can you rest in the power of the gospel? It's hard to do. Because everything around us tells us we've got to produce. We've got to bring results. If we don't bring results, we're not pushing the right button. We haven't found the right trick. But if we learn to rest in the power of the gospel and trust God, knowing he is the one that is able, I think the results will come. I truly do. I think the results will come. I think if we learn to trust that God will, will, will bring about his plan, and we see ourselves as mere humble servants in the midst of that plan, the results will come. Personally, as a church, in our home lives, in our family lives, in our work lives, all across the board, the results will come. So what would it look like for us as a church to really turn to God, depend on Him, to see our own inability, our own depravity, and say, God, I need you now more than ever. God, we need you to work now more than ever. God, we trust that you will work now more than ever. What would it look like for us as a church to really embrace that, to embody that? We, we wouldn't have to worry about our own preferences, would we? Our own concerns, because we're focused on the gospel. We wouldn't have to worry about our own traditions, our own history, because now we have life in the gospel. Would you pray with me?